Thank you all for coming to our Startup Studio event today. Um, I don't know how many of you have been to the last one we did on, um, we did a branding Startup Studio. How many of you, show of hands, went to that one? We just want to see the overlap here. Great. And um, how many of you, is this your first Nelson Center event? OK, well, welcome. Thank you for being here with us. Um, if you want to learn more, um, you can check out our website at entrepreneurship.brown.edu. Um, you can also sign up for our mailing list there. Um, and so we welcome you to the Startup Studio event. Um, these, uh, this series of events are uh, more tactical based. Um, and so we're, we're happy to welcome Soren Reinhardt uh, from Working Planet, a local digital marketing agency, to talk to you today. So um, here's Soren. <laughs> Thanks very much. So if you did attend the branding event, this is going to be very different. Um, and uh, I'm going to give a little bit of intro of where I come from, how we approach digital marketing, and why, to me, this is a really interesting topic. I'm um, going to talk a little bit about the state of digital, but honestly, I'm going to fly through that part. I mean, I've been working in digital marketing for 15 years. You guys have been living in a digital world your entire lives. You probably have a pretty good idea of the scope of the digital world. But we'll, we'll go through it and so that we have a good uh, common baseline on that. And then what I want to really dive into is if you're working with a startup, how do you scale growth? How do you not lose your friends and family round or your seed round by giving it all to Google or Facebook? Uh, managing that risk and finding that growth path is often difficult. And I want to go through some common pitfalls that we've seen with startups that we've either known or worked with over the years. Um, so uh, maybe it can give you a little bit of advice to help avoid um, uh, throwing money away and uh, being faster on your course to success with a startup. Um, and then leaving a lot of time for questions may totally deviate from the path in the middle. Uh, if it makes sense to engage in discussion, I'm, I'm really fine with that. I actually love talking about this. Um, so uh, if it can be more of a discussion, that's awesome. Um, let me just set my timer. OK. Um, so um, one of the things about digital is that there are low-hanging fruit, and we are going to talk about that. There are really good common places to start in the world of digital, but we're also going to talk about sort of all of the options that, that are out there. Um, so my background, I got into marketing in a very circuitous path. Um, Actually, my, uh, my co-founder at Working Planet is my wife. We met in graduate school. I had a NASA research fellowship. We were writing algorithms for processing satellite imagery. This is not the normal path into marketing. It's just my path into marketing. Um, I left graduate school and abandoned my doctorate. I don't advise that, but I did it. Um, to, in 1995, to work for an internet startup. Uh, imagine how risky it was at that time to do that. Uh, my wife uh, ended up working for a think tank in Cambridge doing atmospheric modeling for about six years until she too was bitten by the startup bug. We worked at a bunch of different startups until 2003 when we saw Google being a thing and decided that this was a math problem that needed solving and that we figured out that we could do that. Um, we are a media buying company. We put the math behind digital advertising. And that is the one problem that we solve, which is how to scale profitable customer acquisition through paid digital advertising. We believe that um, internet marketing or any kind of advertising or marketing is a financial investment in a financial outcome. That is the reason businesses do it. Um, and that you should be very explicit about connecting the dots between that investment and the eventual return you get from that investment. Um, we're also, um, oddly for a marketing firm, we're an Agile shop. Um, if you guys are familiar with Agile at all, I am a huge proponent of uh, Agile and DevOps in marketing and uh, speak a lot about that. Um, I won't be talking about that today, even though it is one of my favorite things. Um, but if you have questions later, I'm happy to talk about that. Uh, so we are actually based down the street. We are headquartered here in Providence in Wayland Square, about seven blocks from here. Um, but uh, we work with uh, organizations all over the world. We do all of the global advertising for Harvard Business School Online for their professional education programs. We've worked with Habitat for Humanity uh, nationally for m more than 12 years. Um, and we work with a lot of startups. We work with startups in uh, New York, Austin, Silicon Valley, as well as uh, more established companies all over North America, um, Canada, and one in Switzerland, oddly enough. Um,
this year, digital advertising will surpass all other advertising uh, spend for the first time in history. Um, about $143 billion will be spent on online advertising in 2019. Um, it's not only the biggest bucket, it's rapidly becoming the only bucket. And digital might not mean what you think it means. I think when people think of digital advertising, they think immediately of search advertising and display advertising, but it's so much more. It definitely includes all of those things, but now digital includes billboards, or what's called out-of-home advertising, which is now being fueled by AI-driven programmatic exchanges in the digital world. The buying and selling of it happens um, exactly the same as search advertising. Uh, it can include over-the-top cable advertising, connected TV. If you see an ad, a TV-style ad on your phone or your laptop, that is digital advertising, even though the format might be more like what you've experienced with classic television. And the forms are blending. What we're really seeing is that AI-driven programmatic exchanges in particular are picking up all of the inventory. In the early 2000s, that was display advertising. You used to have to broker with publishers in order to place your ads. Almost none of that is done that way anymore. It's all done in auctions. You'll probably recognize most of these, the big players, Google, Facebook. Um, by the end of this year, I'm pretty sure Amazon is going to be number three. Um, Amazon is rap rapidly becoming a very large and powerful ad network. But there might be other ones here that you're less familiar with. Um, if you haven't heard of Acuity, it's a, it's a programmatic um, ad platform for managing the, those AI-driven exchanges. Um, Stack Adapt, which is a technology-focused uh, specific ad network. Um, and then things that you probably are more aware of from a consumer point of view, like things like Spotify and Pandora, but those are ad digital ad networks as well now too. And we're actually managing internet radio in very similar ways that we manage and optimize search campaigns or display campaigns or paid social. In fact, the growth of marketing has been so massive that in a very short period of time, we've gone from a relatively accessible handful of technologies. So in 2011, there were about 150 either ad networks or marketing tools or tools that were used to manage your either website or your marketing program, whether that's paid or unpaid digital marketing. Um, last, in 2017, that uh, broke the 5,000 uh, mark. I've heard that for 2019, the, when this comes out, um, this gets um, updated every year, it's going to be somewhere between 8,500 and 9,000 players. There is no possible way to know everything about everything in digital marketing. Um, and the good news is you don't need to, you just kind of need to know where to start and you need to know some fundamentals about marketing in general. Whether you end up for your startup using a particular set of management tools, a particular database, a particular CRM, whatever it might be, is really going to be based on your own needs. But overall, the big players have stayed reasonably consistent over time, or at least the big categories, which I'll get into in a minute. Um, the most important thing to understand about digital advertising from a buying media point of view, or being an advertiser as a startup, is that all of digital advertising is sold in an auction. So if all of your perception about advertising comes from watching Mad Men, you need to let that go. I mean, one, there's not that many martinis, um, but secondly, it's not bought and sold that way. And it was no wonder that all of those people had so much time for drinking and affairs because there wasn't that much that you could do. Um, really, you placed an ad, you got the most eyeballs for the lowest cost, you, the cost that you could. You tried to make sure that there might be a demographic fit. And by that, that meant age, location, gender. And that was pretty much it. There are now thousands and thousands of ways to target advertising well beyond demographic or the demographic characteristics. Um, but that's what you had back in the day. You, if you negotiated really well, you got volume discounts. That doesn't work. None of that works in digital. There's no volume discounts. The volume is at the top of the auction. That's what you're bidding to get in front of. The more you bid, the more eyeballs, the more placement that you can get. So you want to be very careful about what you pay. Um, the auctions are driven by a competitive landscape that can vary every single day. 
So the most important thing to understand in digital advertising, if you are buying media, is what is it worth? Because the most powerful thing about the auction is it allows you to pay what the audience is worth. So the heavy lifting that we do and that any company trying to be profitable with digital advertising is going to try to understand is, what is my audience worth to me? The digital world is more diverse, and it gets more diverse every day. I mean, one of the most interesting things to me is that the last year saw more innovation from existing players than we'd seen since probably the first five years of digital. Um, we saw Facebook and Google and now Amazon and, and others coming out with new platforms, new programs, new ways to target audiences, new ways to buy and sell media. Um, it continues to be a rapidly evolving game, but as long as you understand the basics of the auction and the basics of how to measure your audience, you can really take advantage of almost any kind of auction because the mechanics are surprisingly similar across all of the different types of media. What does differ a lot is the ways that people consume media. And I think one of the traditional views on advertising was that individuals would consume uh, advertising in one specific channel. And that's not true from a user point of view, but it was definitely true from the way that, that companies measured their advertising. Um, online advertising was different from the print advertising they might do or TV, and they were, uh, they were evaluated in isolation. And even in digital, it was very tempting for companies with different ways of budgeting and different departments to separate out the different types of advertising they were doing and trying to measure their effectiveness independently. And this led to something which I'm happy to talk about, but I'm probably not going to go into too much detail, called the attribution question, which if you've ever heard that referred to in digital, simply means if people are engaging in different media in different ways, leading to value being created as a customer, how do you give credit to any of those programs that they interacted with along the way. It's a very interesting, very complex puzzle that everybody in digital is trying to answer. Google has some preset, not particularly well, uh, they don't give a lot of advice on what's good or bad when it comes to the attribution question. And so, uh, because Google pretty much is going to take your money. That's, that's their job. Um, so, um, there, there's a lot of complexity, but if you dig into the complexity and you have good measurement, you can take advantage of the complexity in order to find novel ways to create value. And I'll give an example of that um, with uh, one of our clients where we were seeing a lot of traction with the Facebook advertising we were doing, but we knew that a lot of the people who were interacting with Facebook were not clicking on the ads. They were coming to the website, they were doing a brand search on our client's brand, they were going directly to the website and they were engaging. So it was creating a lot of value, but the click-based data that we had was not particularly revealing of the value that was being created. So we figured out ways to do geographic tests and test, um, in this case we tested Texas versus Florida and Georgia, thinking that those would be somewhat similar, at least in population. And what we found when uh, was that half of the value being created from the Facebook advertising was not being recorded in our data. And we then went to uh, a couple of different locations in the Northwest, replicated, got exactly the same results. So we knew this wasn't a ge geographic trend. It happened to be a, uh, uh, something that was real. It was happening with the way that people were interacting with Facebook advertising. So what that meant was that our data was not giving us the whole picture. So I think one of the things that you should realize with digital advertising is there's all the data in the world. We're swimming in a sea of data, but the data has very specific gaps in it. The good news is, like that Facebook data, those data gaps are biased in consistent and predictable ways. And as it turns out, as we measured that same effect across client after client after client, the magnitude of out-of-channel behavior from Facebook was strikingly consistent. Almost in every case we measured, about 50% of the value that was being created by Facebook was happening out of the channel measurement. So data is your friend, but you have to be very careful about how you use the data. Um, very quickly going to go into uh, a bit about all of these. Um, when it comes down to the different types of advertising, um, some of these are really well known. So uh, search, social advertising, I think everybody knows those because you're being presented as consumers with that constantly. So you probably know what a sponsored you know, tweet looks like and 
you know, what search advertising looks like when the ads come up when you do a search on Google. Some of these might be a little bit less familiar. So when I talk about programmatic advertising, programmatic advertising is display ab advertising. It's largely the, um, well, it, the initial big bucket of programmatic is display, was display advertising. Programmatic simply means that there is an ecosystem of technology that matches inventory, ad, ad placement inventory on a publisher site with an advertiser and the ads that they want to place. And the programmatic part simply means that we are not physically making those matches by choosing which publishers and characteristics and doing a manual connection, that there's artificial intelligence that is acting to create that dating game. That literally programmatic is the, you know, it's the match.com, it's the e-harmony of advertising. Basically, we're trying to get advertisers and, and the, the consumers on sites all over the internet to be matched in a way that resonates, resonates in value being created for the advertiser. And so largely, the artificial intelligence is going to be um, using learning algor algorithms to determine where you can make a connection that creates value. So it actually will be using measurements on your website to see when somebody engages, that, that they're either creating a sale or they're filling out a form. And there's some engagement piece of value that you're providing through tracking code to the programmatic networks that it is leveraging to learn over time how to best spend your ad dollars to create that value. The programmatic networks are extremely powerful and the programmatic um, exchanges, which is what the collection of advertisers are called in the programmatic world, is starting to include lots of things that are not just display advertising. And so that's where we're starting to get access to connected TV ads, where we're getting access to um, out of home digital billboard advertising. NBC Universal last year announced that as of mid this year, 100% of their TV inventory will only be accessible through the programmatic exchanges. So classic television, cable advertising, all of that is now being bought and sold in an auction because the auction is a win-win for both advertisers and publishers. It's a win for the advertisers because you get to choose what you want to pay based on your understanding of value, and it's a win for the publishers because it's a race between advertisers to pay the most that they'll be willing to pay for the inventory available on their network, whether that's a website or a TV channel or you know, whatever it might be. Um, another one that might not be as familiar um, is affiliate advertising. Raise your hand if you know what, if you've been familiar with affiliate advertising. One, two, three, five, seven. Seven, you're ahead of the game. Okay, um, affiliate advertising is simply you're paying somebody um, when you get a sale for them introducing your product, service, company to their audience. It's often used, um, if you think of anybody watched um, a YouTube uh, channel and they're plugging audible.com. Familiar at all? Yeah, it's super common. Audible's probably the number one company in the world to take advantage of affiliate and influencer advertising. Basically, they're paying a fee to that advertiser um, in order to create sales. And all of those people are providing a link to audible.com. They get a share of revenue off of that that is preset before any sale has been made. Affiliate marketing is actually great for early stage companies because if you can create a compelling offer, one, you can test to see if people who already have existing audiences are able to connect your brand to people that might be interested in it. Second, there's no risk. You're setting the payout ahead of time so you can, based on your finances, determine what it makes sense to you to pay the affiliate for that sale being connected. It is probably one of the safest forms of digital advertising. The trade-off there is it does take some management. You really have to work with your affiliates. You have to understand when to uh, let an affiliate go. You have to go. You have to make sure they abide by your rules and all of those things. But it can be a very good early stage um, use of digital advertising or advertising that's really deployed in the digital universe. Um, another one that's not really mentioned up here explicitly because it falls into a couple of different categories around display advertising and programmatic is retargeted advertising, what Google calls remarketing. And so if you're not familiar with this, if you've been to a website, you certainly are familiar with the effect. You go to a website and that company's ads follow you all over the internet. So, familiar? Yeah, yeah, I'm sorry. We 
we make that happen. Um, the reason is that follow-on conversation is highly valuable. And so it's a way to stay connected with an audience that has already visited your website. And there's lots of variations on how that get, gets used. And frankly, there's a lot of inappropriate ways it gets used. They, there's a, a technical term that we uh, use called crossing the freak out line, which is when you provide too much information about that user back to them in some ad out on the internet. So you'll know when a company's done this because you'll go to their website and you, you check out I don't know, a pair of sneakers or something. And then the, you go, and the next website you visit presents you with a pop-up ad saying, hey, you added these pair of sneakers to your uh, checkout, and it's only this much, and I know you're coming from this location. Why haven't you bought yet? And so that's a really bad thing to do as an advertiser. So um, we try not to do that. But the retargeted advertising can be very, very powerful. Um, any questions about any of these that are not as familiar, that you have any questions about? I'm not going to go into a lot of detail about the individual formats of advertising. The one thing I will mention that is a huge trend right now is that many, many of these um, platforms are allowing video for often the first time to be used in advertising as a standard ad format. And we're just seeing this massive escalation of video. And if you're a longer term Instagram user, you kind of have seen this uh, transition where there wasn't video for a long time in Instagram, and now it's everywhere. Um, that's the type of thing that's happening in all kinds of places, um, where we're starting to see uh, banner ads and display ads that are video-based, and more ad platforms um, are supporting the use of video. Google actually just announced that within the next month, they're going to make video ads a standard, uh, a standard ad format for all of their display network. Um, not just YouTube advertising, which has traditionally been where they've used display ad, or where they've used video ads. Questions? Yes. Um, can you talk about the different views of these different marketings for maybe different types of products, like for example, software versus hardware, or like just like in what situation it is best to use which kind of? Product? Yeah, I'm going to go into some good starting points in a minute. But you know what we've learned over time is that all of these are good for everybody. And I think that there used to be a big, um, a very strong viewpoint that if you had a B2B business, that you would do a very specific type of advertising that was very different than if you had a consumer focused business. And the reality is, we manage all of those. And the tactics that we use and the networks that we use are not that different. There are a few that have a slight bias. LinkedIn, for example, because you can target on industry and job description, is probably going to be more use earlier on with a B2B business than with a consumer business. But honestly, we do a lot of consumer advertising on LinkedIn. Um, and we do a lot of B2B advertising in social media. So the the preconceptions about where you can find your audience just don't really hold up when we get into the actual use of the different um, the different platforms. I think that there are some specialty networks. One on the, the slide that I had earlier, actually I can just go to it, um, Captera um, in the bottom uh, corner over there. That's a, a software clearinghouse. If you're a software company, Captera is going to be a great for you. If you're not a software company, it's probably no use at all. So there are examples like that that are just completely specialty types of networks. But most of the time, um, there's probably a way to find the audience that you want to speak to in almost any of these buckets. It's really whether the math works with that audience in that you can pay a comp you know, pay the competitive price that the auction demands and monetize that audience at a rate that makes sense for your business. But I will say that's why we find B2B businesses that do really well with some of these more consumer-focused networks is often they have a customer value that allows them to monetize an audience that makes sense to them. Any other questions? Okay. So one of the recommendations that we make for any company starting out, and it's one of those things that you should do sooner than later, is begin your house email list. So a house list is the list that you own. You've earned them over time. They're your connections that you meet, you know, 
people who come to your website subscribe to your newsletter, supporting that out of the gate and then using that and starting to get even a short monthly newsletter out there to your investors, supporters, customers, friends, family, is one of the most important things that you can do. There's a startup here in town called Splitwise um, that has done an amazing job of this, um, where they do a quarterly update on just what they're doing as a company. And it goes to, it's kind of their friends and family investor list. And, it, and they just get out there and expose their metrics and say, hey, here's where we are in our growth path. And it's been, a, I know for a fact it has led to um, that being shared with people that has led to investment in their company. It's all kinds of really interesting things happen when you just get your story out there on a regular basis. And we've talked to companies that are m many years into it, and even very well-established companies that don't even, ha that haven't even thought about creating a house email list. Like email marketing was something to be done down the road. And honestly, it's so low cost and so little time. It is hands down something that you should start out of the gate, even if it's small. Because by doing it, you will also think about how to do it better. And you will start um, creating mechanisms on your websites for people to just sign up for your newsletter. You'll start having a conversation that is more than just the initial visit of your web visitor to your website. So it's a really good thing to do out of the gate. Not paid advertising, but something that is on the list that I would highly recommend. Um, I want to go into a number. Yeah, go ahead. Question regarding newslet newsletters. Yeah. There, I understand there's a tipping point where sending newsletters too often will actually lead to people unsubscribing because they feel guilty that they can't open it. Uh, and read it as often as you're sending it. Is no, there's there a not. recommendation? Yeah, that's totally false. Okay. Yeah, sorry, that's my opinion, but it's based on a lot of data. People believe that because people don't like getting email. Um, the, does anybody here uh, subscribe to email or just get it from like a major retail brand? Yeah, how often do you get it? Raise your hand if you get any emails from a brand that you get more than once a day. Right? Do you unsubscribe? Always? Are there ones that you haven't? If it if it's a brand you're interested in, you're gonna you stay along for the ride. You and you what you learn is that it's okay to not open every email. The um, and I think it's a very different dynamic in terms of what you put into your email calendar uh, for what content you want going out. If you're doing something that's once a month versus doing something that's twice a day. Um, you're probably also a really different type of company. I mean, most like software companies, for example, are probably not gonna put out a daily email. But if you're a consumer brand, there really isn't an upper threshold that we've seen that will start eroding your, your email base faster than you're, you're building it. Uh. And then just a quick follow-up. Should that newsletter be also listed in your website, or should it be attached to the blog, or keep it separate from your website? You know, I like having an, a newsletter sign up that's a persistent like nav element. So if it's in your footer or in your header, um, I think that's really good. Um, it depends on the site. Like um, our, our company, we actually own a number of retail sites that we've created ourselves that is a laboratory for us to work on, because we like to walk the walk. and. Um, we do a really common thing, which is you get to the site and about 40 seconds later you get a, an, an overlay that says you get a discount if you subscribe to our newsletter. That's a really good tactic for a retail brand. I wouldn't necessarily recommend that for like a B2B software company, but you can do something somewhat similar to that. You know, People don't get pissed off at marketing the way that people think they do. And, and certainly not at the level of sensitivity that most CEOs are concerned about, about their own company's advertising. Um, it's, it's amazing that um, people are, they may not pay attention to marketing, but they usually will tolerate it for the most part. Um, and if you don't tolerate it, you're gonna put up an ad blocker, right? So, which, you know what? If you put up an ad blocker, you put up an ad blocker. Um, I get asked a lot, like, do you worry about people putting up ad blockers? I really don't. The, if you're going to do that, you're not going to be engaged in the advertising anyway, and you don't want. And what you're saying is, you don't want to advertise, no matter how targeting it is, to be in my face. So, fine. You will be reached by advertisers in other ways, whether it's through in, influencer, 
advertising, whether it's through you know, PR, um, whether it's through things that are not avoidable <laughs> through ad blocking, um, there's still ways to reach an audience. Um, you know, I, I tend not to worry about that. Sorry, I went a little off the topic. Other questions about uh, email marketing? By the way, um, the on the email marketing thing, you know, one of the companies uh, I mentioned up here is uh, Mailchimp. Does anybody has anybody here ever used Mailchimp? Yeah, quite a few. Super easy. And what, what I will say, they're not the only company out there that that is a really good, easy to use uh, email platform. And they're not what you would use later stage as a scaling company. At that point, you're going to need to get a marketing automation tool like uh, Marketo or Pardot or HubSpot, some of these other tools that are out there where you can really more automate a much more varied, diverse, segmented nurturing program through email. But in the early stages, MailChimp's really good. But one of the things I love about them is they have more resources online. Whether you use them or not, check out their online resources for how to do email. Some of the best stuff out there. It's, it's really good. So once you've got your house, house list set up and you're thinking about like paid online advertising, the first thing that you should do is know what it is that you're trying to do. Um, and that sounds really basic, but it's really tempting to go out and try stuff without being really explicit about what you want from it at the end of the day. And the thing is that digital advertising can be expensive. If you're paying money to do digital advertising, it can add up really quick. You're entering an audience that has, in many cases, 15 to 20 years of competitive bidding and optimization behind it. It's not unusual for us in the campaigns that we manage to run into cost per clicks that are 20, 30, 40 dollars per click. If you're going to pay that, you need to know what you want to learn and then pay the least amount that you need to to learn that specific answer. So, you know, for these particular questions, which are really common ones that I've kind of pulled from our history of working with startups, you really want to know what it is that you want to learn and how you're going to measure it. So if, you know, and that can be really simple, like we need 10 beta customers of this description, you have a wall chart and just as you get them, you list them, you know where you are, you're visualizing like what's out there and how far you are. It's like this is not a technical description, just know where you are so that as soon as you hit number 10, you turn off your ad spend the second you hit number 10. Um, I need to know if people will pay this for my MVP. At that point, all you're trying to learn is if people will pay money, you're not trying to make a profit on it at that point. Those are two very, very different things. Number two and number three are so completely different in what you would do to answer that question that they are worlds apart in the problem you're even trying to solve. One, the second one is so early stage. I just need to know if this idea has value, and I want to prove it by seeing if people will pony up. You're not even trying, like, you could spend 10x what they actually pay you, and that's super valuable as an answer, because what, what you've learned is people will give you money. Probably the most important thing any business can learn. Whether you made any money on that is irrelevant. You will figure out how to make money on it. But if you figure out that nobody's going to pay you money, you need to retool and figure out why, and then do a series of tests to try to get to the next point. Um, the, the next one, though, you've already figured out that people will pay you. Now you're in scaling mode. I need to build programs that can get us the most customers at this very specific return on my investment. And at that point, you need to learn other things. You need to have KPIs that you understand around what's the latency from the time of investment to the time of revenue. What's my expected payoff period? So we work with a lot of software as a service companies uh, with a recurring revenue model. Our KPI with them is months to break even. What does the months to break even have to be so that as I'm investing and adding to my monthly recurring revenue that I know this is going to pay off and I'm not going to go out of business because I'm going to blow my entire runway before we get to profitability or to the next round or whatever the next thing is in the, the growth of the startup. The thing about digital marketing is it's massive. It's the entire world out there. And one of the things that we see people do is try to, how big is the market? 
That's a very dangerous question to try to answer with paid advertising as an early stage company. The answer to that question actually is really easy and you know it before you're starting. It's more than you can afford. That's how big the market is. What you want to do is, is use a spoon, not a bucket. Be very specific about the audience you're going after. Um, be very critical about how you pay for it in order to minimize your risk in using up all your cash to not really learn something at the end of the day. You can always find a bigger audience. And I'll give a couple, of, or I'll give one generic example. We've worked with a number of companies that came to us because they couldn't profitably spend any more in their advertising. They'd really tried to scale up, their marketing hit a plateau, they couldn't find any more, and they came to us and said, we think our market, we, we, we're already maxed out. We are talking to the complete market opportunity that we can talk to. And in every one of those cases, we've 10X'd their campaign because they didn't think about how to break through the constraints to solving the math, the math to allow them to speak to a, a bigger audience. The bigger audience always exists. It's amazing, you know, it's a world of how many billion people, your, prob your audience globally is probably bigger than you're thinking of. And it can be pretty amazing when you start getting out there. But in the early days, you don't want to know how big it is. You just want to get like the easiest, lowest hanging fruit that are going to convert for you. Um, you guys already had a thing on uh, brand, but an early stage tech tactic that I love is do advert paid search advertising on your brand. When we talk about starting points, this is one of the most overlooked and easiest things you can do. You will be getting out there trying to create buzz around your brand. You're going to do it in lots of different ways, and it's going to be different for every startup. You may do guerrilla marketing techniques, or you may try to do you know, content and create content, put your blogs and, and everything out there. Everything you're going to do to create a buzz around your brand is ideally intended for people to search for your brand. If people search on your brand and they can't find you because you aren't ranked number one organically in Google, or somebody else is, or your brand name is a, you know, is an English word or words. Um, we have, we have uh, one of our clients is named offshorecompany.com, right? It's a keyword, their brand is a keyword. So, um, you know, that's a really tough thing to actually get ranking on. So what you wanna do is just get your ad out there. And that way you have the ability to say what's valuable to your audience in the way that you wanna say it for very likely very little money. Um, typically brand uh, keyword traffic is extremely cheap um, unless there's a lot of competition around that, that concept. That usually happens later on. It's one of the easiest things to do. By the way, this sounds like something you do short term just until you get that ranking, but actually one of the most powerful things you can do even if you have the top organic ranking on any keyword is continue to place the paid ad. Because what you do is typically you raise the conversion rate of all of your audience going through your paid and your organic listing by about 15 to 20%. And so you just increase the credibility. Credibility equates to conversion improvement. More people will buy from you. Another early stage, so if you're thinking about social media marketing, there is a safe haven, and that's lookalike audiences. Lookalike audiences are leveraging what you already know about your customers in order to create an audience through their artificial intelligence that is similar to what you already know. And you don't have to actually describe the specific characteristics about your audience. Their AI will do that. So if you have a prospect list or you have a customer list already, even if it's relatively small, you can upload that into Facebook. They'll, they'll match it to their user base, and they will create an audience. And you can kind of slide scale how big or small that is compared to the characteristic that, that it's matching on. Um, basically, the way that works is that you can say, I want to do a 1% match, which means that this audience that I'm, that I'm speaking to is only 1% away from the collective character uh, characteristics that, that we're describing by the common elements in the audience that you put up there. Or you can stretch it out and the audiences get bigger the less defined it is. But it, it is the easiest way to find uh, cost-effective success in the social networks. Um, most uh, networks are now allowing for lookalike audience creation because it is such a powerful tool that they know to their self-interest that you will be able to pay them more money. Um, because you're, you have an audience that you're willing to pay for. So it is, hands down, our number one starting point when we go into the social networks. 
Another thing that's a really good early starting point, search is a really good starting point for almost any new business because it you are speaking to a demand that is clearly being stated by somebody doing a search. But what you do, again, don't go for volume. Go for something that's really explicit. If you have a startup where you're disrupting a market and nobody knows that you exist or that the, your offering exists, go for keywords that describe the problem that you're solving. Because if people are out there searching on how to solve a problem, then that's your audience. And in fact, I know some startups who actually mine the keyword queries around how to in their space to think about how to position their startup for how to speak to their audience because that they are their messaging then defines the problem that people are already stating. So you can really use this in a lot of very good ways. There's also some um, particular websites like Quora.com, which is its own ad network, eHow.com, which can be accessed through the Google Display Network, where you can explicitly target this type of query in non-search traffic as well. So there's, there's really good early stage ways to get in front of audience that are clearly asking for a solution to the problem that you are solving. Um, I use these um, for based on that example that a couple of slides ago, uh, or one, these guys, phone wagon, they're a call tracking startup. So basically, they have code that lives on people's website that dynamically generates phone numbers. They then tie those phone numbers to the keyword query that led to the search that led to the call. Gives you the same kind of data on phone calls that you get from people doing search. Really cool data source for marketers. So you know what makes good keywords for them? How to track phone calls on the web. Call tracking marketing tool, and this one I love, CallRail, which is their biggest established competitor, alternative, because they're half the price, if not a tenth the price. They're really, you know, phone wagon's incredibly cheap. If you have calls, I recommend phone wagon, by the way, as a call to action on your website. Um, the other thing that is newer in most of the ad networks is AI bidding. And Google and Facebook are really touting this, but I want to put a word of caution out there. It can be your friend, but it can also be very dangerous. So AI bidding allows them to mine all of the signals that they get off of users beyond what you're targeting. So typically, say, in search, you would just target on the query that people are typing into Google. Um, AI bidding allows Google to then use all of the other things it knows about that user to determine whether or not to put an ad in front of that user. So um, what it is doing is optimizing to, say, conversions. And you can put in the cost of conversion that you want. These AI tools will get better over time. They are still in fairly early stages. So one of the things that we've, landed, uh, we've learned is if there's anything around conversions or actions that you're trying to optimize to using the AI bidding in AdWords or Facebook, you really need a history of conversion already in order to fuel the AI learning. If it's learning from scratch with no history, you're probably going to spend a lot of money on the learning curve. And they don't yet really have a good way to get past it. I fully believe they will. I think two years from now, I might come up here and say exactly the opposite. But right now, if you don't already have a history of measured conversions that Google in Google's tracking or Facebook's tracking, they're probably going to founder for a long period of time. You're better off really doing manual bidding. Do a little bit of math yourself. And by math, what I mean is, Matching what you pay in the auction to the value. So here's the key. It's the super simple equation that is behind any bidding tool ever that has ever existed and is out there now, which is your bid price is your target cost of acquisition times your conversion rate. That's it. I will say that again. Your bid price in any auction is your target cost of acquisition times your conversion rate. If you have a $100 cost of acquisition and you have a 10% conversion rate, 10% of 100 is $10. You can spend $10 per click. That's simple. So that back of the envelope math can really help you in thinking about what you should pay out of the gate by just throwing some darts. Or it can help you evaluate what your programs are over time just by looking at whether or not it makes sense from a math point of view. Does that make sense? I, um, I answer a lot of questions on Quora. And one that uh, was asked recently is, what kind of math do you need to learn in order to be a digital marketer? And the obvious answer is statistics, because everything we do is based on statistics. But I actually said algebra. Because that 
equation of balancing you know, cost of media, conversion rate, and value is the core to everything. That the click, you know, the, your cost per click equals your target times your conversion rate. That's a basic seventh grade algebra equation, which for you guys was probably like fourth grade algebra, right? <laughs> but um, the, uh, you know, it's super, it's super straightforward. The cool thing, which also comes from algebra, is that if you're trying to balance the equation, you can balance any element as the variable to balance the equation. If your cost of media can't be changed, raise your conversion rate. Do landing page testing. Address the math that way. If you can't address either of those, address your customer value. Can you upsell? Can you bundle programs? Can you charge them more? You know, there's so much, you know, when I talk to CEOs, nine times out of 10, if we're talking about pricing, I'm gonna tell them to raise their price. Because almost immediately, they're going to be able to make the math work better for the people that are willing to pay the additional price. That's why I like working on luxury goods, because there's a lot of margin. Um, common pitfalls. Don't do too little for not enough time. I'm going to do this for a week. We have 30 clicks. What did we learn? Nothing. You didn't learn a thing. You have to do it for a period of time until you have enough data to actually answer the question that you asked, and you have to know what that question is in order to know whether you're there yet. Sometimes that takes a long time. Sometimes it doesn't. If you can bias your questions to take less time and money early on, you can more quickly learn and advance. You have to think about what that means in terms of how you think about digital marketing. Another common pitfall, which is the reverse, is going too big too fast. Um, Google and Facebook will take all your money. They're really, really good at it. Trust me. Back 2005, we had a company come to us. Uh, it was a debt, debt services company. Uh, it was a single person company startup. Uh, Google rep set up his Google campaign, turned it on, spent $5,000 an hour. Um, he checked in later that afternoon. Then he hid in the closet for about a week. Then he called us. Um, the good news is he figured out he had a market opportunity. Bad news was he used up more than all the money he had so he had to go back, borrow a bunch more money, figure out how to avoid bankruptcy and a whole bunch of other issues that he had hoped to avoid. Story was good in the end. We actually grew his business. Still a single person company. He sold it about a year later for about half a million dollars. Um, so good to know your market opportunity, but you can do it in a less risky fashion. Um, so just mind your, uh, mind your uh, budgets on that. One of my favorite ones, though, is this. Using early data to pivot. And so, how many here uh, are aficionados of Lean, Lean Startup? Anybody? Nobody? Nobody knows Lean. Lean, okay, building your MVP, blah, blah, everyone. It's like everybody, and it's like so obvious that nobody's raising their hands. Okay. The, um, so, everyone in Lean, you talk about pivoting. Like, it's, it's all there. Okay, I learned all this. Now I have to take that feedback and I have to pivot. We have seen startups pivot on extremely early data. Your early data does not mean you need to pivot. It might just mean that you need to tweak and test something a little bit more. And that's, and that's it. So go a little bit further before you say my one week's data is enough for me to pivot on. It's probably not the case. Um, and very lastly, if you're going to charge, charge. Uh, don't think that, any, that putting your offering out there for free uh, gets you any education at all. It doesn't. We worked with a startup that got tens of thousands of users on their free product and thought they were you know, on their way to raising money. They put up their paywall, crickets chirping. Not a single person purchased from them. Tens of thousands to zero is a big difference. So put your paywall up earlier. If you're de developing an MVP, charge people. It's the best way to do it. Um, I know we're up against time, and I really uh, want to do it. Uh, last thing I'll say is don't assume your early numbers mean anything. Things can always be changed and tested. Um, repeat testing, hypothesis testing is the key to success on this, and that's really it. So um, know your goals. Know what it takes to learn. Keep testing. One profitable thing pays for a lot of testing, and I'm at the end. Any questions? Yeah. Um, you mentioned that it's a hard waste of time. So yeah. Um, can you 
talk a little bit more about that, like how you find the right influencers and how to reach out and the entire yep. process? So um, there's two big answers on that for in, how, do you, how to find influencer marketing and affiliate. Um, for affiliate marketing, there's two big networks, ShareASale and CJ Affiliate, it used to be called Commission Junction. You can go create an offer, load it up online, and they do all the other work. They'll help you broker the payouts, they'll help you do all of that stuff. Um, for things like influencer marketing, say with podcasts, podcasts are actually a little bit behind the game. You actually have to reach out directly to the, the talent and broker a deal with them. So like most all of the US-based podcasts are not done, it's still pretty traditional. You have to kind of set up a, a, you know, a deal with that person and figure it out. Um, so it's a little bit more manual. Um, UK is actually a little bit ahead of the US in terms of that, but we're getting there. Next, any other questions? Yeah? Um, can you also talk a little bit more about um, to be marketing? Because you were saying you can also use consumer, like social media platforms for, for, for B2B. Yeah, like how does that work? yeah, I think the, the biggest difference is that there really isn't any difference in the mechanics that you just have different data. Typically with B2B, you're often working with lead-based data. This can happen in consumers too, but um, a lot of your data is going to be post-lead data, so lead quality data, things like that. If you can work a little bit deeper in the funnel and match that back to the audience, it's easier to get an idea of what's working or what's not working. Um, I think that, that um, B2B marketing is no different than consumer marketing in that you still have to focus on your value proposition. You still have to come up with messaging that resonates with the end user. There really isn't any difference in terms of tactics um, with B2B. Like I said, a couple things might be a little earlier stage like LinkedIn, but um, when it gets down to the tactical media buying, it, it really isn't that different. The data side might be a little bit different. Yeah. yeah. As a media buying company, what do you what do you look for in a website that will make you say, my clients need to be on this site? Um, I don't look at anything on the website, <laughs> surprisingly. Um, there isn't any predetermination of where you should or should not be when it comes to digital advertising. Um, it's really about using what works and what works for us is a math problem. Um, the, we will test almost everything. There are earlier or later stage things uh, that you can try. I think one of the things that I really like to do with um, early stage audiences that are not technical audiences um, is to use Bing instead of Google as the starting point. I actually just wrote on Core about this yesterday, that um, a lot of companies ignore Bing. Um, they only have about 12% of the market share for search. Um, a lot of people in a technical audience um, don't use um, Bing very often. Um, but the, the quality outside of technical audiences is, is just about as good as with Google um, in terms of like conversion, but it's much less competitive. Your dollar just goes a lot further in Bing. So for early testing, Bing is not a bad place unless you're, like I said, if you're speaking to computer programmers, don't use Bing. Yeah. Thank you. Sure. Okay. I'm gonna hang out for a bit if anyone wants to chat about anything, but thank you very much, I really appreciate it. Thank you.